transition. And uh, what I'm going to do is that I'll take you through the journey at uh, through the journey uh, at multiple levels, and uh, I want to sort of try and be you know string a lot of lot of information together but in a way that it makes sense to us and that we're not overwhelmed and it sort of just uh, stays with us uh, logically, okay? So that's what I've, I've tried to do uh, in the talk. And happy the Shara, that's a post that should be made. And uh, this is the day we, you know, we celebrate the win over our 10 senses that are represented by Ravana was the 10 headed demon. I think that it's a great day to talk about, uh, talk about a, a big uh, milestone in our life, like uh, When we are looking at the senses, the senses are the ones that are taken, or there are things that we do, the choice of what we do, how we talk, how we interact, how we with the people around us. So all of these 10 senses, they are really, they're really Lost her. Yeah, I think we lost. She's here, but Doctor Rami, we cannot hear you. Deepa, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Yeah, I think we lost her completely, right? No, she. Yeah. She is still there, but I think her audio is completely gone. Okay, yeah. she's back. You know, these days the, the you know, it Comcast. She's Hello? back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is I hope this is gonna be well. This came back on over there. I moved inside to the to a different location to keep it. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go back. Yeah, everybody's go internet back. is being becoming flaky. I've, I don't know. I never had this problem. I've taught classes from here. I don't know what it is. Needed, I'm going to move to another place. I'm sorry about that. Okay. So, <clears throat> so I think Dashera presents with us a great opportunity for how do we engage with our motor and our sensory senses. Um, and uh, how do we use them wisely to, uh, to undergo this transition? Okay. Yeah, we see it now. You see it now, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So <laughs> I wanna share with you some good news first, okay? The good news is that, uh, is, is the definition of Ayurveda in my mind. That, you know, I think that modern day Ayurveda, uh, from whatever you read online and uh, what people are promoting, it really comes across as a lifestyle practice that, you know, you must do this, you must do this. There are a lot of benefits that they talk about different practices. And they're all very important and they're extremely crucial for us to know that we have these, you know, to take care of our health. Yet at the same time, I feel that people who go onto that path, they need to, they, they need to know that they're not supposed to just follow it blindly like an Ayurvedic prescriptive lifestyle that it is not just about those uh, things that you incorporate, like, oh, I should do Abhyanga, I should do this, I should do uh, different kinds of practices, right? They're great if you can do. 
But the best way forward that Ayurveda actually expects us to, to uh, incorporate is to know about these practices and to use them when your body truly needs it. So you're able to pull it out like an arrow, pull it out like a tool that you are using. So the entire landscape of products and practices that Ayurveda offers, they are all tools for us to gain back balance. And that balance is, our, is going to be our key focus during the transition and also, of course, on a day-to-day -day basis. In this talk later on, we'll talk about what are the what are the threats to our balance when we undergo an, a menopausal transition? So when we are just aware about those, we prioritize focusing on those so that you are uh, investing your time and resources in the right direction. Okay. So this was one where this, this is the sutra which defines what Ayurveda is. There are a lot of sutras out there that say that um, or oh, Ayurveda's definition of health and Ayurveda's definition of this and that. But this is one obscure definition. It was considered obscure because there are a lot of different interpretations of this uh, definition. And when I sort of teased it apart after 10 years of studying Ayurveda, I relooked at it and I thought that it actually boils down to understanding the cost, benefit, and risk of every life choice that we are making. And I validated that with one of the Sanskrit scholars who was there at the Vaidya Scientist Fellowship Program. This was done as a part of my postdoc. And he is like the most revered Sanskrit scholar. I said, Tattacharya Ji, this is what I think Ayurveda is talking about. Is it right? So he said, yes, it's right. So this actually gives me a free will free wheel to reinterpret all of the things that we are doing in our deep, in our current world. Okay. So when we say integrative Ayurveda, right? I say integrative Ayurveda consideration. I wanted to just share two cents about why integrative Ayurveda and why it is different from normal Ayurveda or what part of it is different. Does it include modern Ayur uh, uh, traditional Ayurveda? It absolutely does. But it also draws from yoga and spirituality, which are sister sciences, traditionally sister sciences of uh, Ayurveda. But it also draws from modern biological sciences in terms of understanding what are the, what are the phenomena that are occurring in our body? What happens when we eat? What happens when a certain product is taken? Um, what are the what are the pharmacological effects of it? And from an Ayurveda perspective, also there are a lot of details for the actions of those herbs and formulations that we try to teach to students, which are very nuanced. Okay, they go beyond the vata pitta kapha uh, vata pitta kapha uh, classification that exists currently in contemporary Ayurveda. And that classification of Vata, Pitta and Kapha is, Kapha is a, it's a very clever, it's a very clever design to communicate all of these nuances as groups so that you can, you can talk about it. And that is the start for us to get into the world of Ayurveda. Once you enter the world of Ayurveda, there, you know, you, there's of course more depth. So, uh, using Vata Pitta Kapha in the right context is also important because uh, what I am noticing is that a lot of people use, go online, they see that, oh, I'm a, they take their body quizzes and they say, oh, I'm a Vata or I'm a Pitta, I'm a Kapha. And then they look at the lists of the food lists of what to avoid, what not to avoid on the basis of that. I think that is fundamentally wrong. And we should not do that because Ayurveda expects us to eat a very large, wide variety of foods. Those food lists that exist, they are important when you are actually having a vata imbalance, not when you are have not when you are a vata prakriti. 
So a lot of other the Prakriti people, they start eating, start, they, they stop having cruciferous vegetables and all of that. That's not the right thing to do. It's only when you have a vata imbalance and your agni is poor that you need to avoid cauliflowers and broccoli. And otherwise, you know, they have excellent nutrition. We want to invite nutrition to come in from all sides. Okay. So that's one uh, delineation from traditional Ayurveda and the contemporary projection of traditional Ayurveda. So th these are some background things that will help you regardless of, of you know, this, regardless of menopause itself. But, and how do you piece all of this together? How does my mind piece all of these things together? Is that I say, if I have to recommend something to somebody, my recommendation typically would be based either on a traditional practice, which has been, which I see repeated, which is there repeat, repeatedly in multiple texts. Okay, so that's what I call tradition, or what I see a lot of my peers constantly practicing, handed down from generations, or it would be from my own experience and, of course, experience of my peers, and. The other part being evidence, and that's the modern day evidence in terms of the classical clinical trial designs, etc. I'm very uh, involved in the in the uh, thought processes that will help us emerge new new age evidence for Ayurveda, but that's a topic for some other time for some at a different level. But using all of these tools, what we want to do is that we want to problem solve. We want to problem solve together. And we don't want to, we don't want to throw the ball in someone else's court constantly. We need to know where the ball is and we need to be able to uh, uh, have a strategy for the game. Okay. And the game always has multiple players in it because life is not lived in isolation. So what's it with the transition? So Rumi's quote, I really like, and uh, I hit upon it during my marriage transition. The art of life is the balance between holding on and letting go. When I packed my bags and I came to the US and what I put in my bags, and I'm sure all of you have experienced it. Then during a transition, the conscious efforts to maintain balance they need to be amplified. That's what I feel. And there's this quote by Louis Carroll and Alison Wonderland, which says, my dear, here we must run as fast as we can just to stay in place. If you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as fast as that. Okay. And uh, in transitions, it might become even more sometimes. And for the people who are lucky, it remains as, uh, as twice as fast. So, so one of the key one of the key uh, ways that I have found helps is that whenever you embark upon a journey and you think about menopause as the journey, you want to sort of hold on to the idea of the the destination. And suppose you're going for a trip to Hawaii. Okay, when you're going, you're packing your bags, you're doing that. You, you, have an, you have the beach in, in your mind where you will go and you will relax and you'll put your feet up, right? The feeling of the sand underneath your feet. And you have that. This is something similar that we want to do when we, are, when we are undergoing a menopausal transition as well. And that allows us to not get uh, disturbed by the events of the travel and, uh, you know, sometimes you, you, you lose your luggage or you have a fight with the, with the guy, the immigration, or I don't know what, not immigration, but the, the ticket selling guy, uh, the, flight, the flight attendants or whatever, right? But if we lose our energy in that, then, then we're going to land up on the other side exhausted. And exhaustion is not what we want to get at. Okay, we want to be there energetic. So it's similar for this transition. And if I really see what are the tool books and this, the tool, what Ayurveda truly does and the advice that, you know, uh, in my consulting, 
practice, what really helps me is when I think of, about my advice as energy management and all throughout the day, uh, it's, it's energy management for this moment, for this day, for this week, this month, the year, the decade and the lifespan. You want to stable, you want to be a stable shooting arrow. And that stability, if we keep our mind on, it is a dynamic action. It's a dynamic journey. It's a dynamic process. And it makes everything a lot of fun. And the flux is fun. There's no boredom to it. There's no question of boredom to it. And there's no question of, uh, you know, uh, being being in any kind of a rut or any kind of a any kind of a uh, practice that binds us, you know, we need to create rhythms. We definitely need to have our own rhythms after understanding our own body's needs for energy. Oh, some people need to be fed more uh, more frequently. Some people have one meal in a day and they are okay. What works for my body? What is the priority for my body's energy? To take a moment to start that way for today, like for, for one day and then build it on. That's the anchor. Now this energy also has multiple dimensions. The multiple dimensions are, you know, how you are feeding and nourishing all of these aspects of our life. And how are you gaining energy from them also? And identifying where, doing which actions drain you and which actions replenish you from inside to outside. So you go from the, from the, uh, from the spirit, the mind, the body, you become more and more gross and more, more and more uh, external with your family and professional lives and the world at large. Now, you know, I wanted to share an example of a lot of us who would feel about, feel, we, we all feel worried about the world right now, right? Vis-a-vis -vis COVID, vis-a-vis -vis the elections, vis -vis -vis so many of those uh, things that we can influence if you're a citizen and you can vote, you can maybe influence it. But for the rest, we will need to find a way of creating our circle of influence. For some people, that exists within the community, community outside. To some people, it's just in their family unit. For some people, it is just a circle of influence within their selves, right? And that's for our engagement with the world that, okay, what is it that I can do? And Ayurveda says that you wanna start with the self-care first, and then you wanna extend out because that's the way you are going to, that's the way you will actually have a shot at being able to do something externally, to, to, to influence something externally. So that's one part. The other part, if I, if I took, take the example of the spirit, right? And there are, some, there are some activities that will completely drain us and they just don't sync with our personalities. They might be very good and they'll be good to do, but if there is something that totally drains us versus if there is some activity that you do half an hour off and you feel, yes, I'm taking my life, I'm steering the boat of my life in the direction in which I imagine it to be, then that will be hugely replenishing. Half an hour of that activity feels hugely replenishing. So for us at this age, you know, anytime after 35, 40, we begin having a sense, that sense of who we are. You know, we are less, we are less uh, frazzled by the world outside. We just know our, we know, we know our uh, limitations and strengths. So identifying that will help us create a picture of where we want to be personally and spiritually, say 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line. And I want all of us to maybe take a moment right now and think about that. You want to do that? You don't need to share it, but I want you to think about it. That what would make it make life worth it for you?
So keep the thoughts with yourselves and maybe at some point we can come back and share those as a community. But, uh, you know, I want to share with you uh, two of my clinical mentors in women's health. So what I told you until now is more of the spiritual dimension, more of the attitude level for menopause. And I want to sort of get down into a little bit more into the biology of it and share with you what has been my experience and why you must listen to me. So <laughs> um, it's more, it's more, I think I, my, my uh, viewpoints on menopause lie from a lot of experience that I drew from two of my, my mentors who were experts in women's health, uh, coincidentally. Dr. Rama Vaidya on the left, she is now an 82 year old woman and she's just phenomenal. She is my, I don't know what to call her. She's so much more than my mentor. And she's a reproductive endocrinologist. She founded the Indian Menopause Society. She's been, uh, she just recently was invited for the uh, Silver Jubilee uh, audition for, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the IMS. And she and when all the gynecologists of India, when they will gather and when Ramama will stand up, everyone will sit down and listen to what she has to say. So, um, and there are many introductions for her. Uh, she, taught, she taught me how to really practice integration on patient. And on the right is uh, Vaidya Ami Parikh who taught me Ayurveda and uh, you know, with the pulse and the uh, herbs and the formulations. And her clinic has always just been overflowing uh, and, her, uh, and her outreach has been very wide as well. So we have both of them. And with Rama Vaidya, you know, she started a program called as Maitri. And Maitri was was a program that would help people, help women in the menopausal transition. So what she did was that she would invite these groups of people, 10 women on a Sunday, one Sunday in a month. And they would do, they would be assessed physically uh, for their, uh, all their labs also done, their nutritional status, yoga, conversations with the mind, for the mind. There was a psychotherapist, there was a, yoga expert and uh, then they would be individually assessed and then there would be a group counseling session for those 10 women and she did this for 20 years on a, on a regular basis and she's maintained data with it she meant she published it and she used all of that to inform uh, her colleagues in India as to how to manage and support women in the transition she has been my direct mentor so uh, with her in the clinic, uh, when I saw women of the menopausal transition, her advice as being on the other side uh, for that, uh, you know, there was a social spiritual angle right at the end, but it always started off with the symptoms and the labs. And then she would address what she could address and she would then uh, refer out the things that she did not know that she could not address. Okay, and to me, that's the heart of integration. Okay, so what is menopause? And a lot of us are wondering about that. And menopause is actually technically defined as twelve months since the last menstruation. The age of onset is between forty-five to fifty-five. Typically, the mean is at fifty-one years. It's been happening sooner uh, in a lot of in a lot of uh, women, especially in um, South in um, in India, the mean is lower. What it means is that there is it there's an onset of lasting estrogen and progesterone deficiency. Both of those hormones are going to go, they're going to plummet and they're going to go. You're not going to have the support of these two very influential players, which do a lot of things other than just creating a menstrual cycle in the body, especially estrogen. Progesterone does not have that many uh, systemic effects that, 
that can that that its absence cause trouble for okay premenopausal changes so if any of you are wondering whether i'm am i getting premenopausal or not there's some of the tests that help to know whether you are to headed that way and there's an increase in the follicle follicle stimulating hormone uh, on the second day that's a test that's done and there's an anti mullerian hormone also uh, which reduces which actually tells you more about how many eggs you have remaining in your ovaries okay so so that's the technical definition i actually made a list of uh, certain manifestations the symptomatic manifestations that we see commonly in in the menopausal transition now before that that menopausal transition can last from about 3 years to in some cases also up to 10 years okay so the rockiness can exist for up to 10 years now this is not to scare you or anything like that but there are there uh, there are certain ethnicities that are more prone to prolonged uh, effects of the transition now uh yet on an average we could we could we sh we should sort of think about it as a ballpark between 3 to 5 years okay. so when i prepared the talk i realized that you know it's a it's a good long enough duration for us to work on and support each other for because the, there is uh, it's not something that goes away in 3 to 6 months so we can so we can support um, on the other side and i think the community uh, help uh, makes a big difference okay but not all of us are going to experience these symptoms there are some people who are more prone to experience them and Uh, they tend to be more of the the people with more of the vata and the pitta imbalances so now why do i say that is that most of these shorter term manifestations of the transition they are many of them are the vata symptoms and the second frequent are the pitta symptoms so vata symptoms are you know vaginal dryness atrophy nearly 50% uh mood swings memory loss some joint or back ache there can be palpitations there will be decreased in re reduced interest in sex uh urinary frequency and leaking i'll come to fatigue later with vata pitta there are uh you know hot flashes everyone's heard of them and uh, we'll talk more about those in detail but they are more vata pitta in nature they are more pitta than vata and they apparently they impact 60 to 80% of the women so they will experience some amount of it while you undergo the transition okay then you also have insomnia anxiety chills and night sweats which are an extension of hot flashes then there is hair fall also which is a vata pitta feature you also have uh, kapha where you have increased weight gain slowed metabolism there can be some uh, elements of depression in about 20 to 30% of the women experience some amount of it and there can be increased in lipids your uh, lipid profile will change because estrogen has an impact on that and then fatigue Okay. fatigue i write that i was it could be a vata fatigue or it could be a vata pitta fatigue or it can be a kapha fatigue now the point of this slide is not to really get you teaching you ayurveda but for you to get a sense of what can be the association of the imbalance with certain manifestations and then you can use some of the corrective therapies which are a lot of people write about and you can identify which would work for you and that should be your first round of self care that you can uh begin to do because if you don't have this lay, laid out there's a lot of confusion on where to go and what to do so i'm hoping that this will become an initial strategy guide
So what are Ayurveda's goals for menopause? What can Ayurveda do? So we can definitely help to reduce most of these symptoms. Uh, we as an Ayurveda. And when we say we in Ayurveda, it doesn't just mean the Vaidya or the uh, or the physician, but it is, it's you and it's us and it's, you know, all the tools of Ayurveda that exist. So you can reduce symptoms. We can reduce the Vata Pitta nature. Most of it, because it is Vata Pitta, so we reduce the Vata Pitta nature of our food through our foods, lifestyle, and also if needed, herbs and formulations. But you begin with eating foods that are not just going, that are not very sharp, pungent, and not very hot. And, you know, uh, things like garlic and all, they will really rock, they create more sensitivity in, uh, in, um, in a system that is more primed. To it, okay, so you want to try and avoid all of those kind of foods, and you want to take more of the cooling ground, cooling or warm, um, but grounding uh, meals which are well prepared. So that really allows to reduce the physical the, the physical noise of menopause and allows you to go through the day by making the right right decisions. Okay. Then identify individual risks and health priorities. So, you know, some people, they have uh, hyperlipidemia can be an issue. For some people, uh, weight gain can be an issue. For some people, I, I worry that, you know, their bones, we need to take care of a little bit more. And they need to, they need to you know, focus and do something three times in a week for their bone health, right? So all of those kind of risks we need to identify. Some people have risks in their social support system or in the family or in financially even, right? So all of those need to be subverted uh, well. Supporting sleep. And supporting sleep is extremely crucial and we'll talk more about that. Uh, supporting digestion and nutrient intake so that you are not making wrong food choices when your moods are unstable and uh, you're not messing up your um, messing up your uh, physical health just because you reach for comfort foods. Supporting the tissues and organs, supporting the mind and guide for the social spiritual aspects of living. Okay. So hot flashes. Hot flashes, somebody said that they're experiencing a little bit of, you know, hot, cold, thermo, uh, thermo dysregulation is what I'm calling it now, the thermo dysregulation of uh, menopause and it just feels like you know the more I read about it also this week I looked into it a little bit more in detail it feels like the body is undergoing a very short burst of fever because what happens is that the temperature spikes up it's only the surface temperature it's not the core body temperature that spikes up only the surface temperature that spikes up and it creates heat in the system and then um, uh, there's this heat in the chest and the face. That's what they describe it as. It's more, more in the upper torso. And then there's flushing. And then there will be sudden sweating and perspiration and chills and then the person's feeling cold. And a lot of people, uh, they say that they perspire so much that the bed becomes wet. Like it, 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 it soaks. It's soaking. And these are the things that we actually experience in now. Uh, in a fever too and it lasts for about three to four minutes okay it's not happening all day long it comes and it goes but it can yank you out of sleep and you call that's what they call as night sweats okay and it can it can disturb a woman's sleep now i'm just thinking that there's so many things that disturb a woman's sleep like why do only we have to bear all of this right? <laughs> so um that's that hot flushes and sweats um okay this can last for six months to maybe many years okay so what is the modern treatment for it because this is integrative ayurveda we're going to look at what are all the tools that are available to us and when to use them judiciously okay? so menopausal hormone therapy has come a long way there was this there was this trial initially they used to give a little bit of the estrogen progesterone hormones it's good for everyone it's like vitamin 
and they would give it. And then they did this massive study called as the Women's Health Initiative. And in that they realized that, hey, it's actually causing more stroke and cancer and it's causing thromboembolism, it's causing, you know, blood clots to form, etc. So they said, hey, it's not for everyone, but then who is it for? So now it is boiled down, thankfully, to this narrow subsection of people uh, who just cannot bear their hot flashes and they want to, they are given external estradiol and uh, cyclic progestins uh, to control that. So normally they can give just so hot flashes are considered to be a symptom of estrogen deficiency itself, okay? They don't have anything to do with progesterone. But if you want to give estro estrogen for a longer period of time, then your gynac will suggest that you also take cyclic progestins alongside, okay? Um, so that's what uh, it's for. And the secondary benefits are for sleep and moods and a little bit for joint pains and aches as well. Now, who are the people who should not take estrogen externally are people definitely with hypertriglyceridemia. And there are a lot of them in the South Asian population. We have a lot of hypertriglyceridemia. Okay. Uh, anybody with active gallbladder disease or any blood clotting problems known as thromophilias. So they are contraindicated. Um, however, when we look at this, because there exists the risks for long-term use of estrogen, we say that you want to you want to use uh, you want to use the therapy only when you are when it becomes unbearable and it really doesn't allow your life to function. Then that's the time when you go and you take that treatment. It also. So you have to ask yourself, is it absolutely needed? And if it is absolutely needed, then you must allow yourself to take that support without feeling any kind of guilt. Okay. But before that, you can also always see that, okay, what are my alternatives? If you have the bandwidth to process, what are my alternatives? And is there a role where I can do two things together and fix it? So we, remember, we are talking about 60 to 80 percent of the women who are undergoing the transition are going to face some varied degree of this. Okay. And if you don't, then you are lucky. Okay. So you should be grateful and you should go and help someone who is not, who is experiencing it. Okay. Um, so the true purpose, so the true purpose of estrogen, in my mind, is only to reduce the rockiness of the transition because suddenly it's like this that. If there, is a, if there is a very strong uh, uh, molecule that's supporting health and if that is taken away, uh, supporting the cells and that is taken away, those cells, they feel bereaved and they cause these symptoms, okay? So I want to talk to you about black cohosh and black cohosh has been used, um, has been very widely studied for postmenopausal women and how it helps to replace, um, reinstate some amount of the estrogen in the system. And seemingly, it seems it's fairly effective and fairly safe. And we must, you can look into this plant and how to take it. I have some of the things written down in the slide, but you can look into, uh, look into uh, its dosing and all of that as your first bet before you get into a, uh, a synthetic estrogen. Okay. And of course, always, whenever you are uh, taking any herb, look, actively look for herb drug interactions if you're already taking something else. And that's one part that we get into the learning of so that uh, uh, that helps us know what we are doing as far as possible. Okay. Then there's another food which actually has a very good effect on estrogen and there's a wild yam and it contains uh, diosgenin uh, which is a precursor to the sex hormones and sort of replenishes, allows the replenishment of estrogen and if, when people replace wild yam uh, instead of rice for two to three times in a 
two to three times a week. Uh, there was a group that replaced wild, uh, uh, had wild yam instead of rice. And there was another group that had sweet potato instead of rice. Okay. So the one that had wild yam, they, they had increased uh, estrogen levels in the blood and they had reduced levels of uh, the breakdown product, which, are, which really meant that it helps to uh, reduce the breakdown of the estrogen and make it to circulate in the system more. It, that's at least one of the mechanisms of the wild yam. And apparently it's native uh, at least to East, Eastern uh, North America. Sorry. Then we come down to more of the traditional classical Ayurvedic herbs which have been used for the menopausal transition and they're beautiful agents. How much time do I have? I have about half an hour, okay. Um, so we have Shatavri and Shatavri is, uh, it's sweet and it's bitter. Now, when you look at the entire uh, composition from an Ayurvedic perspective, it is Vata Pitta reducing, it is grounding, it is slightly warm as well. It is not very intense on the Agni. So it allows easy assimilation in the system and it has all of the estrogenic supportive effects that someone would want in a menopausal transition. So whether it has direct estrogen impact or not, it's not as well studied as black cohort is, as far as I know. But it has all of the effects that estrogen uh, provides. Okay. And Shatavi is also grounding and it is uh, building in nature. It's available in many formulations, many different types of formulations. So you can seek it whenever, whenever needed. Then the next one which we have is Ahsoka. Ahsoka is, Shal is uh, Saraka Ahsoka, the Ashoka. The tree is more, it's used more for, you know, this kind of bleeding that can occur, intermittent bleeding that can occur. In my mind, it has more of a progesterone kind of an effect in supporting the cycles. So, so with uh, with Chatavi and with uh, Ahsoka, with Ashoka, this combination can help to regulate cycles if the dosing is done right, or help to support the rockiness of the transition if the dosing is done right. So, this is something that I would definitely put as one of the uh, some components of the plan okay and the rest around it needs to be individualized but this is uh, where we have ashoka now ashoka has different properties than shatavi so shatavi like i told you is more uh, grounding and it is uh, more building in nature it's more vatapitta reducing ashoka is more kapapitta reducing uh, more kapha reducing, especially it's kashaya and it is thick, uh, it's absorbent. Think of it more like a sponge, okay? And it's cool and it's dry. And uh, Ashoka's has an impact apart from bleeding. There, is, there are reports that it's also used to reduce uh, hot flashes in conjunction with the other herbs like shatavi, that's what my choice is. It's also useful for depression. Ashoka itself means a shoka. Shoka is depression. And to not have depression is Ashoka. The formulations that exist are uh, Ashoka Rish, is Pushyan of Churna. It's also available as a powder. Now, Yashri Madhu. Yashri Madhu is licorice and it's very commonly used. They say that, hey, it has. It has uh, estrogen-like properties and, you know, it's very widely used for the, for the menopausal transition. However, I would, I would use this plant with caution because uh, licorice uh, is uh, very good for an acute small period of time. But when you have to use it long term, it changes the way in which some of the electro electrolytes function in the system in certain cases and it 
it leads to an increase in sodium retention. Now, you know, bring on uh, higher blood pressure and have some other negative consequences for the long term. But short term, this plant is can definitely be I'm back. Okay. So they they have these formulations called as deglycerinated licorice, which does not have that much of an impact on the sodium ions and all of that. And I would urge you to uh, use that if you want to use it for the slightly longer term. Okay. Uh -oh. The second other symptom that's very common is vaginal dryness, and it can sort of interfere with um, a is of estrogen withdrawal. And it can interfere with uh, having sex, and it can be treated by definitely applying lubricants and oils. And your, Sorry, if it becomes up. really bad, then there are estrogen based vaginal creams that you're. Okay, you are breaking. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, you're back. Okay, cool. So we, we go on to vaginal dryness. And for that, we, um, you know, that we'd be talking about estrogen based creams that your gynac might prescribe. And Ayurveda itself has uh, a lot of medicated dhritams and oils that we use for internal application. So if there's a good hygienic application internally, you can do that. And sometimes if it becomes a little bit more, then uh, you there are some therapies that I have used in some of my patients. Uh, I think we've lost Dr. Nami. Yeah, looks like it. Poor thing, she's having audio, she's having uh, internet issues. Mm. Can you hear me, Deepa? Yeah. Yeah. And yes, I have just shifted. I hope that this internet is better. And you can, right? Yeah, I just hope that it doesn't go off again. Okay. So the, uh, the therapy is called as Yoni, Dhavan, and Pichu. Okay. And uh, Pichu is like, it's like a gauze uh, of uh, cotton gauze that's dipped in oil. And that's what you insert inside the vagina. Okay. Depression in menopause is again um, one of the big um, issues, big, bigger concerns affecting about quarter of the women. And, you know, it's 
Some part of it is biological because of the estrogen withdrawal itself, and some is because of the consequences of it. So it could be due to the persistent vasomotor symptoms. So whenever you hear, hear the word vasomotor, it actually means hot flashes. And when they start affecting the sleep, um, then there is a fallout effect on the moods and the stability the next day and the energy. And when it becomes, if it becomes more chronic, it leads to more prolonged uh, sadness and withdrawal, a sense of withdrawal or uh, lack of enthusiasm for doing things around you. So, so is this, so the one question that I have, Dr. Remy, is that all these symptoms that you're referring to, that you're talking about, are they only during the transition stage or do they continue to exist after hitting menopause? So depression is, depression uh, happens, can happen later on as well. But the other two, the first two, they are typically in the transition. So whenever I say transition, what does transition really mean, right? So transition is like, it would be like uh, a year before you actually, uh, it's it's a whole two to three year phase. So, you know, things will, you'll have dwindling menstruation. And then at one point of time, you would not, you, you would stop menstruating. And then a year will have to pass before you say that, okay, I've hit menopause. And oh, then there will be a fallout effect about a year more. So therefore I say that this is about a three year a game, right? That you are looking, looking at, looking at at least a three-year game, um, given the per, you know, considering the periphery. It can be longer, but the transition is at least this much. Now, when in this transition, the hot flashes and the uh, vaginal dryness can exist. Vaginal dryness can continue later on, also, but then there will be a lot of other adaptive things that kick in. Okay. So now the thing that we have to understand and learn about biology is that nothing is, um, that thankfully the body is not designed to create a, you have a dependency on one kind of a system alone. So it's like this, that uh, you have uh, help from something and it is working very well. That's great. And then later on for the function, if that help is not there, then there will be other uh, adaptive tools that will kick in to maintain the function, okay? So that's the beauty about, about uh, biology in general. Now, what we need to do is that we need to support and do all the right things uh, that, that, that the adaptive process is, is uh, taken care of, care of and you're not sort of, uh, uh, you're not making bad decisions for that adaptive process, right? So that's also a part of the uh, part of the thinking. And a lot of those things start from uh, at the level of the mind, how you're making your lifestyle choices, what kind of uh, foods you're putting in, are you doing things to irritate your system or are you doing things to pacify your system, right? So all of those questions become high level important for us to uh, maintain, okay? So that's your part of your job to do. So does that help? Yeah. Okay. Then when we're looking at depression, we are uh, looking at, um, uh, you know, a quarter of the women who would, uh, who would feel it. And these things are very well supported by Ayurvedic formulations and there are external, um, you know, I think using vitamin D, vitamin B12, they have a big role in depression to correct it. So we have a lot of tools now and a lot of understanding now to deal with depression, but you need to acknowledge that what you're feeling, right? And you don't need, you need to sort of not fight it uh, just because, you know, sometimes just uh, fighting it by your will can exhaust you more. So you need to take support for that. And that's what I would sort of uh, urge you to do. And, uh, you know, depression is different from day-to-day -day sadness, right? So what is the, when, when it lasts, the sad, sad feeling lasts for about two weeks continuously, that's the when, that's when you should sort of have your alarm clock going up, do some of the tests and identify where you are and do things to actively counteract it, okay? And then involve your family and tell them that this is what you are feeling and be open about it and uh, seek help. 
There are therapies also that you can do with nasya and some selected agents. There's some oils and ghatams and herbal extracts that have been recently using and having very good results. And then uh, there are, uh, I want to sort of caution against prolonged meditative practices because I feel that depression, see depression and anxiety are two different things, right? Very different things. And anxiety can be helped with a lot of the, breathwork practices and you know calming down and relaxation modes uh however when you do those for people who are already de depressed and people who say go and, and sit for very long duration it's uh, their thoughts and feelings only get amplified and they are even more isolated with them um and i feel that that has um uh, especially in our ecosystem in the US, where as it is, we are so isolated, it only aggravates the problem rather than it suppresses the problem. So I would caution against, uh, against using meditation as a practice, but using mindfulness as a tool, that's a completely different uh, proposition. Okay, I, I hope I'm unclear about this and not... Uh, Herbs. Um, sharing. Are you sh supposed to be sharing something? I'm not sharing. I'm not sharing. I am supposed to be sharing. Okay, just hold on. I think. You were sharing before, I think, after that last uh, episode of connectivity, you stopped. Okay. Okay. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay. So then, of course, there are some herbs that can be used and um, visible is insomnia and, you know, protecting your sleep is vital because that's going to allow, uh, regardless of anything else, it's going to allow energy to remain conserved and the right choices to be made. And the after you make the conserved, you conserve your energy and you get that feeling rested, ensure that you don't while it away and do things that are going to add on energy. Okay. But how do you do that? Is that there are a lot of tools for sleep hygiene, there are a lot of Ayurvedic bedtime practices that you can find all over the internet. And there are essential oils like uh, lavender, especially that I really like to use and it's very easy to use. There's also an Ayurvedic, uh, there's also an, uh, a milk based uh, uh, recipe that I use with piplimul, nutmeg and cinnamon for giving at, night, at bedtime for uh, giving for, for good sleep. And if you're a vegan, you can do the non-dairy alternative. Right? Now, insomnia and sleep are, are converse. Okay? So when your sleep goes down, uh, insom sleep and anxiety are converse. So sleep goes down, anxiety tends to go up. So when we just get the balance out, both of those get corrected. And also to deal with anxiety, you want to do more of the sleep promoting practices. Now, another consequence of insomnia that can occur in the menopausal transition is is metabolic syndrome. Because for when you when you're not when you're that sleep deprived for that long, um, and a lot of other factors that are that uh, get into play causes insulin resistance. And this is a very well known fact that the menopausal transition really increases your chances of becoming pre diabetic, okay, uh, or having metabolic syndrome. So that consequence we have to actively correct by ensuring that you're not eating comfort foods like carby comfort foods or greasy foods, um, 
So take care of your nutrition, take care of your exercise, and you can hopefully reduce that possibility. Now, this is a very staff study. This is, I really, uh, uh, th th this visual really makes me sort of jump in my seat a little bit. Uh, because if you see, this is the waistline, okay? Five years. So this is at zero is that, uh, this is when, uh, the zero is when the person becomes uh, menopause starts and minus five is five years before menopause. So if you see the waistline, of the people of 543 uh, premenopausal women, it's at 88. And then five years after it reaches up to 97. So at the menopausal transition itself in those two to one or two years, there is this incline. And I feel, what I feel is that if we, are take, if we take care of the transition well at that point of time, then it's gonna stabilize and it will continue that way for longer. But otherwise, your system is going, the set point is going to be somewhere else. So this is an opportunity. For me, I think that every transition is an opportunity for us to uh, zero in, like zoom in back again. So this picture is really representative of that. There are a lot of other effects of estrogen because estrogen is a, uh, is a big game player. Okay, from the skeletal muscle to the liver to the white adipose tissue to GI to heart, bone, brown adipose tissue, immune cells. So all of these, I won't get into the details, teach you biology right now, but the impact is very wide. And when we are trying to look at things that at a systemic level for support for systemic level, apart from all the diet and lifestyle activities that we already know about, uh, using guduchi always comes to my mind because it's my hero herb and uh, it's my uh, it's for any vaidya I think uh, it's it's the best uh, it, it, it's the best go-to it does everything that a vaidya wants to do and more and he and it does it very appropriately so using guduchi uh, for systemic effects is at least going to be at least one part of the support that's gonna go in into your care. It's restorative, it's an adaptogen, it has an impact on all of those things that estrogen has an impact on. I can share studies with you for what Guduchi does at every level, okay? We can like do a class just on Guduchi. And it's available in multiple formulations. There are powders and standardized aqueous extracts and shamsham, nivati, and amritarish, kaishor, gugulu. You have to identify which one works best for you. And nowadays, there are a lot of Ayurveda practitioners out there. So you should totally seek advice and ask for, uh, you know, ask for help. And of course, we have Sarita. So she's going to, uh, you know, identify for which Prakriti or which Vikriti, what kind of formulation will, will be right. Then the other one is metika and using fenugreek seeds, which are soaked. Uh, oh, my daughter is back. Uh, so um, fenugreek seeds, which are soaked, uh, they will really help for the entire metabolic effects as well. And they will help for bone health also. So I think that uh, this is a good addition. I would recommend soaking them because alone they are very heating and they are warm. But when they are soaked, they are not. Um, and if they, if you just eat, consume them just like that, then they are actually going to increase. There's a possibility of it increasing pitta, which we don't want to do. So, what are the definite goals for everyone? I shared goals for Ayurveda, but from our perspective, from what we need to do for menopausal transition is. First is to manage emotional stability as far as, uh, as, far as possible. And I think in that, uh, I wanna share that nowadays you're going to hit menopause uh, at a time when you're gonna possibly have teenagers at home, okay? So earlier, earlier when we see these transitions, there were all the sanskaras 
that were laid down as the shoulder sanskaras in ayurveda of what are the 16 life transitions that we were being prepared for and menopause to my mind it overlaps with the vanaprastha ashram where they say okay you know you reduce your worldly duties and you can go into you can you can go into your sadhana mode or you can get in get away from the regular uh, household or duties now for us unfortunately that's not going to happen because we are having kids at home and you know there's dependencies so we need to sort of prepare for these two things together so prioritizing that i think is the most crucial and that can happen with good communication and understanding and you know taking the first step into saying that oh what is this menopause about so that's the first step that everyone's taken today and second is minimize weight gain uh minimize weight gain uh then it is maintaining metabolic health glycemic and lipid profiles ensuring enough rest attention to building muscle and bone like putting your strategies on building muscle and bone and maintaining a connect with our partner with everything that we are undergoing and if he gets overwhelmed giving him an out so he get boyfriend time i'm going to get girlfriend time <laughs> and can maintaining a connect with your friends <laughs> girlfriends and uh, get strategy and coping skills for young adults who are present at home hey, no Shh. okay so that brings me to the last slide and that is that i i was just thinking about how to end this uh, talk and i remembered this sutra from uh, charak it says pravrutti hetur bhava nam na nirode asti karanam kechit tatrapi manyate hetu hetu avartanam it essentially means that as regards to their rise as regards to their arise things stand in the need of a cause but no cause is needed for their cessation time alone is enough so even in the latter case some however hold that the non continuance of their causative factors is a cause of their cessation so what this really means <laughs> is that i i think that i i i want to sort of say that you know health can be actively created that if there is a conscious effort for creating health then health will get created and if that conscious effort reduces then then it will deteriorate so that's one of the interpretations of this sutra but there are multiple other interpretations but i i call this a sutra when something abstract like that can be applied in multiple different ways and uh i feel that this science that exists in the form of these sutras in terms of these relationships that's uh, embedded in ayurveda that science eventually developed into multiple art forms and those art forms then everybody practiced that art became a culture of doing certain things together and then the culture held on to the science and how do we sort of create a culture that holds on to the science because not for the sake of reverence it's there's no point for the sake of reverence but it the point is to say that hey this has been found and this is the path to lasting joy and health and happiness and there is certain amount of safety in this that it takes care of your entire being because you're doing things together as a community and then that's what allows things to remain sustained and i feel that in this new internet age if we align our if we align our thought processes uh, we will be able to relive these at a completely different level so with that hope oh, happy dashara and uh, i'm open to questions thank you it's thank you. it's very helpful um, i mean the uh, basically i think you hit on all the points all the things that we can expect and of course the cure for it is uh, 
there is a cure so that's good to know there is some not cure but there are ways to manage it so that is good to know yes yes definitely definitely see that there, there are i say you know that ayurveda either there are ways to manage it or there are ways to endure it mm. so or create uh, a life around it right so i think that's the part of the eastern wisdom where you are able to um I, you you're able to watch what's happening to you watch even your suffering with a, as a sense of a witness where you are a velcro it's like hey i am you know it's like you can say that i am sad or you can say that i am feeling sad right now right similarly that i oh this is feeling and this feeling and that pain your mind is only in that pain or you just figure a way out to say that my leg really seems to hurt and oh my god like you know how do you how do you delineate the processes yeah. and that's the part of uh, that's the part of the eastern wisdom thank you so much doctor um i don't think i got a chance to introduce myself i was a little late and you just started um this is divya and i got the invite from my friend shweta and okay. she's also here and yes. it's it's excellent and uh, you know it's very comforting and uh, to know that these exist and there is a, a cure and you know we don't really need to suffer <laughs> through that years um one question i had so um i from my friends and also my mom one of the symptom that she had was excessive bleeding um so what is there is there a you know something that we we need to take care of? because so there uh, irregular periods is one of the symptoms right and at some point in time i also hear uh, some of my friends and including my mom um, face where it just got really excessive from no periods after 6 months it got you know excessive periods where oh, oh, in fact one of my friend had to take some blood iron transfusion um mm-hmm. state so is this something common or do we know the symptoms of that to so, avoid so there are there are two three things that come to my mind first of all if this if you're talking about a menopausal woman experiencing that then first one of the first thing that comes to my mind is to definitely rule out a fibroid okay and fibroids are known to cause excessive bleeding so that's an ultrasound is what you need to first do second if the ultrasound is okay then it really means that there is the endometrium is getting built but it is not dropping at the right time and that means that seems to be more of a progesterone issue progesterone issue uh and that's um uh, it, it's actually an imbalance between both estrogen and progesterone so there are certain herbs that you can take to uh, for you definitely need medication for you know situations like that to support and uh, uh go through um go through that phase it's not something that you can treat with diet and lifestyle okay but uh, is was she investigated or not uh yeah uh, she's taking um medications um for it right now and i uh, think because of that it's uh, under control okay uh, but i'm not sure de- i don't have the details of what kind of medication she's taking but i know my mom just went through it um and then she had her menopause okay. um but so yeah. i and is it also true that you tend to follow your mom's path and have the similar symptoms when you go through them typically medical. only for the age of onset otherwise i think it's more determined by your constitution and a lot of other lifestyle practices okay got it okay and like i said thank you um this was uh, uh, this and a lot of ways it was eye opening too so knowing Thanks, what to expect what about yes. calcium dr nami you didn't touch on that yeah i just talked i summarized it more like just like bone health but um i think that it's not a pressing need uh in this transition but i think if we talk, did a talk about postmenopausal and 
preparation for I see. It's part of that. Okay. But definitely at this point of time, a lot of resist exercises and resistance exercises, the bone and muscle building exercising. So, you know, including those, uh, like I told you, like in that phase, especially in those two, three years, right? You want to focus on doing that. And, you know, the thing is, other part is, whenever you talk about depletion, okay? Uh, the whenever there's a rate of depletion. So for example, initially, if you have 100 cells, if the rate of depletion is 50 per year, for example, then uh, it's 50%, then next year you'll have 50, right? Mm -hmm. And the year after that, you'll have 25, right? Sorry. But suppose initially you have 1,000, hmm? then next year you're only 500. And then one more, 250. So the decline will be lower, which means that your input at the initial time will matter long mm. in the transition. One of the um, uh, mottos of the Indian Menopause Society was uh, being for the woman to be strong at 60 and independent at 80. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's a nice yes. goal to have for it's all of us. Job, right? <laughs> right? right? Absolutely. It's a very nice absolutely. goal for all of us. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that so those are the kind of images that you want to say that okay, that's what I want to be, and that's what life is gonna make me make make it worth it, make it worthwhile, right? Yeah. So you wanna does anyone want to share their goals? If questions are done, are there any more questions? I have a question. Yeah, tell me who's that? Uh, okay, Shweta. Hi, hi. Uh, hi. It was great, great talk as usual. I mean, I expect, I expected no less from you, and of course you delivered. Um, <laughs> Thank you. The my daughter. This is this is the other side. She just attained puberty. My daughter, and she is. Um, she went through um, a few months of very regular periods, but then her periods have gotten irregular and heavy sometimes, and it's not. At what point do I say, okay, I need to take you to the doctor, pediatrician, Ayurvedic consultation? And at what point do I think that it is normal? Well, uh, I, I am concerned because every time we come to this point where we think it's medically needs to be intervened. escalated, it's then she's like, oh yeah, the bleeding stopped and everything is fine. But then again, we go through a two or three days where there there's problems. So is there a flag that I need to look How for? How young is she, you tell me? She's uh, 13. 13. So, well, I think that, uh, I think about, I think you should, and what was the age of onset? Uh, 12, like last year. It's been a year. So fairly, I think give it about five, six months more, about a year and a half to see whether it stabilizes. But meanwhile, ensure for her also that she's not putting on a lot of weight or anything like that. Because... PCOS is again a common thing with when there are increasingly irregular periods. Okay. But that's not a problem initially because we are still we are still see the year, year and a half as a settling in time. Okay. But if it becomes too much and you want support, you can begin support with some gentle herbs for now. And then if you need, we can use hormones later. Okay, sounds good. It should not feel disruptive for her life. If it feels disruptive, then Got you see help. Then you see. Okay. But if, for example, it lasts until age 14 or 15, then you definitely seek help. Got it. Great advice. Thank you. Most welcome. Okay. Uh, hello, Dr. Shweta here. Yeah, Shweta. Yeah, it was very nice. Nice talk. It was uh, good to get a insight about, you know, what what to look forward. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Nami. This is Deepa. Thank yes. you so much for navigating us and, you know, what to expect, what to do. So your all tips are very helpful. One question I have is like, you said a lot of uh, Ayurvedic herbs and methi, which can control Vata Pitta. So these should be take, when should we take this? We, should we implement them from now itself or when we are almost approaching? No, no. So it's like I told you that those I told you were more for management, right? And what do they do? 
you need to take them only if you feel that there are symptoms and imbalances. Don't take herbs otherwise. Uh, when it comes to methika, methi you can definitely take, especially if you have any other risk factor, then it I would suggest that it will be good for you to take. Uh, if there are any other cardio metabolic disturbances, then you can also take. If at all you are a thin frame, uh, prone to you know the bone pains or joint pains and all of that, or low back ache, you can take methika. But but the other sadaka, ashoka. Shatavri and all of those, those are only for symptoms and things become very rocky when you can't manage things by using some basic uh, diet lifestyle principles with Ayurveda. Uh, then you can avail of those herbs and they're perfectly safe. But uh, I definitely would, you can try it for some time for two or three months. But if you want to take any of these herbs long term, I suggest that you should definitely get a consult for, with an Ayurveda practitioner uh, for taking any of the, any of them long term, except for Guduchi. Guduchi and Methi are okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what is your uh, feel on sprouting Methi? It's good, but it is a little vata aggravating to sprout. The, in general, sprouting as a process is considered to be vata aggravating, although it is it makes it light also. But soaking is enough. You don't need to sprout. Save your energy. <laughs> because it activates the enzymes. You know, soaking itself will activate the enzymes that are needed. Um, you can have smithy sprouts once in a while, but not needed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I had a related question to that for Methi, Dr. Nami. Yes. Sure. Uh, so how um, how much should we be taking if we wanted to include it in our diet and how often? It's about one teaspoon. You okay. soak one teaspoon. That's good enough. For some people, I do go up to two teaspoons, but one is safe for everyone. Daily? Daily. Okay. And you and just have it by itself or do you just mix it in your food or...? Uh, no, you can just like have it, have it by itself in the morning. And okay. when you smoke the methi, you know, the bitterness goes. So you discard the water, don't have the water, only the seeds. Okay. And that's safe to take uh, at any point, you said. So you can start yes. with it. Yes. Uh, especially because I... you, especially have... Shruti. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I missed it in your plan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, especially when you said, you know, joints and bone health, I think. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Awesome. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you, Shruti. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nami. I have just one uh, question, not just specific to this, but like, uh, do you have any recommendations on any good reading material uh, that no, covers specifically on women's health from Ayurveda perspective? No, <laughs> no, okay. Sorry, but there are a lot of books out there. I think a lot of practitioners have written about, you know, the theoretical aspects as well. I think Maya Tiwari has done a good job. Uh, I have not read her recent publications, but um, uh, yeah, Maya Tiwari is a name that comes to my mind that a, a, a person who appeals to the Western uh, context. Okay, thank you. We'll check it out. Okay. Dr. Nami? Yes, Sarita. Wow. That is, your mic's working. Yeah, your mic's working. <laughs> and I can hear your soft voice. Okay, I'll speak louder. <laughs> you know, bone health seems to be a big issue one way or the other. You know, like yes. a person with knee strain, you, you can expect bone loss. And then with people who are hefty, it's somehow all the nutrition stops at the medha and does not move on. So right. how, how do you nourish bone tissue? Like what are the simple practical tips in daily life that we could do to nourish bone? Yeah. So, you know, I wrote a... Um, I've written some book chapters for sar both sarcopenia and osteoporosis. And I think the nutritional, the nutritional and exercise 
results are definitely very good. Now for bone, you definitely want to do some calcium, but calcium tends to uh, go in the wrong places very easily and cause calcifications. So one of the ways that I've found to keep it in the bone uh, is definitely to keep, take it with the vitamin K27 supplement. So there's a 50 MCG dosing that you take along with it. Uh, and of course, D3 and magnesium are important from a nutritional standpoint. That comes from your nutritional supplements, right? Then when it comes to foods, a lot of calcium increasing foods, especially the ones that Ayurveda relied on, were the proteins, the, the caseins from milk. But now milk has become a big controversial, uh, debatable point. So we need to identify other such dense sources that will nourish bone health well. And to me, nuts and nut milks that are made at home definitely come to my mind. Also, uh, I don't know what the calcium content for coconut and all is, but you know, in terms of the Ayurvedic energetics, even coconut will help to support uh, the bone health apart from the other nuts, uh, you know, the almonds and walnuts and um, that part, ensuring that the nutrition is assimilatable, all of these foods. So the you can put in whatever, but if it is not going to go in, then what is the point? So properly spicing and using the bitters. The bitters will help to get the nourishment going. Uh, well, and especially I think in Sarita, in your case uh, with Jira, uh, I think Jira is also very crucial for absorption of nutrition for you. And um, there are, of course, more of the calcium rich uh, green leafies, the thick, the, you know, the, uh, the sturdy leaves, especially, not the ones that we use in salad, like, you know, the lettuce and some of the other flimsy greens call them the, you know, the, the sturdy greens, like the collards and the mustard greens and the chards, all of those are also useful. From an exercise standpoint, just doing, uh, you know, doing resistance exercises on the largest muscles are the first priority. So, you know, using your, using them for your, um, for the thighs, the quadriceps and the thighs. Uh, there are exercises where you stand on your toes and there's, stand on the knee on the, on the heels stand on the toes and stand on the heels or when you when you are sitting and watching tv you take your foot forward and you put some ankle weight on it if you don't have any other back issue or anything like that if it's safe enough for you to do then doing some resistance against gravity or just holding your feet up and seeing for how long you can hold your feet up when you're sitting on the edge of the table edge of a chair all of these are some simple tools which will allow activation of the muscle and getting the bones in, in shape. Apart from that, maintaining joint mobility for all the smallest to the largest joints. And the mobility is not just, you know, a lot of physiotherapy, they just do stretching and strengthening. But we want to do all around. So you're actually moving, moving each, each joint uh, and uh, then you are strengthening it. So you'll come to know the range of motion, just being aware about all of this, you know, and these things not to be done with fear. They need to be done subconsciously that, hey, what's happening there? So watch it as a witness. Let's say, oh, that needs a little work. Oh, I can give it a little bit of loving care, right? So that's, that's the way to do it. So not to feel fearful about it. Can I add an epidemiological uh, perspective on the bones? Absolutely. What they, they have found is that most of the sun, um, the countries where there's a lot of sunshine, there's a definitely a lot less um, bone-related diseases. And even in the, and the, the, the funniest thing is even in the countries where there's a lot of sunshine, the people in the countries where there are women, especially who are more prone to these injuries, are, for example, culturally clad from top to bottom, for example, the Middle Eastern or something like that, yeah. they yeah. have more, more I... problems with bones. So because just the exposure of your skin to the sun makes a difference. 
because not yeah. just should you be under the sun but you actually your, your parts of your body should be exposed and that's just from the epidemiological study so it's not it's just a population okay. studies so right right no vitamin d i think is so vital and vitamin d is very vital from a covid perspective also now that fauci is talking about it but even before that i've been talking about vitamin d uh, and you know recently there's also the data of i'm sorry going a slightly off topic because covid is such a big deal uh, you know in the homeless shelters of uh, san francisco they did not have that much covid apparently because uh, everyone was given vitamin d supplementation so i think that's a very interesting uh, data point and apart from that even for treatment and all it's all coming in maintaining healthy amounts of vitamin d is important because you can very easily do too much of a good thing because vitamin d toxicity is also known so you want to sort of maintain it up to 100 is okay they say but i like to maintain it at about 70 and then you know that gives you a little bit of scope so that sometimes if you take a little bit more or less you're not getting into a toxic zone okay okay so this was fun people i hope you have a great evening shall we call it a day or any more questions anyone else Yeah. just would like to thank you again i appreciate you taking the time sharing so much precious information with all of us really appreciate it absolutely thank you so much for being such a great uh, for giving me all your years no one listens to me so much <laughs> <laughs> i'm just thank kidding. you thank you dr ami i always think of you i think of guru ji <laughs> Oh that that's a good thought it's a good thought <laughs> I have <laughs> never heard of that term ever only after i hear your talks i've been learning guruji guruji <laughs> i know guruji i have to talk about guruji it's like you know I, my talks are incomplete without it i don't know why i think they're all barking up the wrong tree with turmeric and ashwagandha and all i'm like dude you guys have missed the point <laughs> so <laughs> can can we can we grow guruji here Ah, Sarita, <laughs> because Sarita is like I've been telling. I was telling Sarita that she should teach us all how to grow herbs here. She's like the expert for that, right? So, but yeah, she's doing a project. But I, um, be keeping fingers crossed, and hopefully she's able to do it. Yeah. Hi, Azu. You reached home. Yes. You want to say something? Namaste. Oh, thank Hi. you so much for the great, uh, beautiful presentation. It was very nice and informative. And then thank you so much, Sarita, as well for you know providing the platforms. It's okay. good to see you, everybody, as well. <laughs> oh yes, yes, absolutely, Izu. Thank you, thank you for coming thank on you. board. Okay. Izu is Izu is the uh, like I told you she's an Ayurveda practitioner and she's also an Ayurvedic chef. Okay, we used to create <laughs> a lot of recipes at at the Renew program, and hopefully we are going to re renew ren that effort. <laughs> That'll be very nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Izu. Okay, everyone. Thank you, Sarita Ji, for organizing thank this. Thank you. Take bye -bye. care. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.